We are studying Jacob's letter to the 12 tribes. It was written to the descendants of Israel. Jacob is Jacobus in the Greek, Jacques in France in French, Iago in Italian, Diego in Spanish, Yaakov in Hebrew, and of course we know it as the book of James. And uh, it is self-declaring as re- being written to the 12 tribes of Israel. The early church was, of course, a very Jewish church. And there are a number of Jameses in the Bible, but we believe for lots of reasons that I won't recap in this review that this is the Lord's brother, or technically you'd say his half-brother. Uh, his brothers were not believers before the resurrection, according to the scripture, but were afterwards, and James rises to the leadership in the Jerusalem church. And we talked a lot about that in our earliest session. We, of course, are in the seventh session of eight total on the book of James. And so I won't spend more time on reviewing all that. But I will mention this, is that if we uh, we should essentially finish the book tonight, in terms of the, we're in the fifth chapter, and I think we can get through 20 verses. But um, we do have a special session next time to deal with some peripheral issues about James. It may surprise you to learn that James is the subject of some very specific heresies that are, I believe are re-emergent on the horizon. And anyone that doesn't know their Bible very well runs into the risk of being substantially derailed from their faith. And we're going to deal with that next time. The Shroud of Turin, the Knights Templar, Freemasonry, and what has all that got to do with James. We'll talk about that next time. Uh, we'll just jump in tonight to redeem the time. We're in James chapter 5. And one of the things that's going to take up right up front is this whole business of the rich. Many Christians are confused about money and about wealth. Being rich is not a sin, but it does have some very severe hazards. And one of the biggest hazards of being rich, strangely, ironically, is selfishness. You know, you would think, gee, if a guy has abundance, he's not going to be, he's going to be less selfish. Except life, generally, there are exceptions, of course. But in general, life is not like that. And that's one of the things that uh, James is going to deal with. James chapter 5, verse 1. James chapter 5, verse 1. Go now, go to now, ye rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Now, you're going to discover as this all unfolds that these particular rich men had some problems. It's not because just they were rich. It's how they got there and what they were doing with it that will unfold in the subsequent verses. But let's sort of hit some of this right up front. The Bible does not discourage the acquiring of wealth. The first, one of the first big men of faith was Abraham. And he was one of the wealthiest men on the earth at that time, by many scholars reckoning. He was a very, very wealthy man. There's much evidence of that. But in Genesis 14, when the occasion comes, there were, well, there were nine kings that were warring against each other and uh, getting clobbered. Kings of Sodom and Gomorrah were clobbered by Shetelamar and the whole bunch up there. And when they came down to spoil, they happened to take Lot with them uh, as part of the captives. He was <laughs> Abram's nephew. So you talk about the Entebbe raid of Israel or whatever. Hey, Abraham goes after these guys up to Laish, the northern part of the country. In fact, they found a mud gate there, it was, which is because some very peculiar circumstances was preserved. Those things are not that durable. But that probably uh, uh, is dated from about that time. But anyway, the point is, Abraham wins, retrieves them, retrieves a lot. And uh, But it mentions in the passage there, it mentions, Genesis 14, that he raised up a trained army of 318 from among the servants that were born under his tents. I mean, this guy, you know, you talk about servants. I don't know how many you have. I don't have any. (laughs) I don't, can't think of anyone that has 318. You know, I mean, that's, but that gives you at least a glimpse of, of what was going on there. Now, also, Job was a wealthy man. Now, he God used the occasion to, to put him to some tests, but the point is, David, uh, Josiah, Philemon, and Paul writes the letter to about Onesimus, and Joseph of Arimathea, one of the wealthiest guys in the region. 
He had direct access to Pilate. You don't just do that, you know. And uh, Lydia mentioned in the epistle. These were wealthy people. The Jews in Canaan owned their own property, worked it, benefited uh, from its produce. The, the acquisition of private property is ordained in the scripture. In many of Jesus' parables, he indicated his respect for personal property and private gain. That's the underlying dynamic in many, uh, uh, many of his uh, parables. There's nothing in the epistles that uh, contradicts the right of ownership and profit. One of the things that you need to understand, and I'm not going to take the burden to try to get tutorial on this, but you need to understand the rights to private property and personal freedom are inseparable. You can't have one without the other. And our founding fathers in this country understood that. We'll move on. What the Bible does condemn is acquiring wealth by illegal means or for inappropriate uses. And that's really what we're going to be getting into. You'll discover the writings of Amos and Isaiah and Jeremiah thundered their, me- their messages against stolen wealth and the abuse of the poor by the, by the rich and selfish luxury. Those are the themes. Because of those themes, many Christians sort of get the idea, well, gee, wealth is bad. No, the misuse of wealth is bad. Money is neutral, and it can be put to either into all kinds of appropriate or inappropriate purposes. Wealth is a spiritual handicap because uh, material possessions tend to focus one's thoughts on the world. Uh, the problem is not in the currency, it's in the heart. Money isn't the root of all evil, it's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. You'll talk about that. But anyway, we worked our way down to verse 2. James continues, Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Verse 3, Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Wow. He's going to deal with the way they use their wealth. You say, wait a minute, gee, uh, gold doesn't rust or corrupt. What was rusting? Their heart. They were. And that's, in effect, uh, the part of the pun that's involved in here. Now, don't get confused. There's nothing sinful about saving. 2 Corinthians 12, 14, 1 Timothy 5, 8. In fact, just instead of just throwing these out, turn to 1 Timothy 5, 8. This is one that I think needs to be emphasized in today's churches, especially because of uh, some things that are on the horizon. And I think it's useful to go through the discipline of looking it up and marking it in your Bible if you haven't marked it. 1 Timothy 5, 8. Paul says to his protege, Timothy, If any provide not for his own, but especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Whoa. That's rough language for a guy like Paul. Pharisaical background. If any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, there is a call to provision. There's a call to, to do some estate planning. That's what it's all about. But anyway, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 14 and Matthew 25, 27 also point out nothing sinful about saving. You're admonished to do so. However, it is wrong to store up wealth if you owe money to others. These guys were selfishly guarding it for their own security and pleasure. Gee, they were hoarding wealth. Hoarding applies if your acquisition of it is denying its benefit to somebody else. There's a lot of rumbles now. People are storing up food because of Y2K. Is their purchase of food in the present market denying anybody the food in the present market? Hardly. Hoarding is a term that's more properly used if somehow your acquisition of it is denying somebody else. Today, that's not true. Now, the day may come when that may be quite different, but the point is setting up a store in anticipation of a need isn't hoarding. In any case, um, 1 Corinthians 4.2 says it is required of a steward to be faithful, and that's what we're called to. Now, the problem with these guys that James is going to focus on is the way they got their wealth. Not only the way they used their wealth, but also the way they got their wealth. Verse 4, Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, Crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth, or the Lord of hosts. You may recall in Matthew 20, Jesus talked about a parable about a guy who was hiring 
for his, his fields. And you sort of get the, the system that they used from that parable. You, you can read uh, again and again, uh, God is, really emphasizes. Turn to Deuteronomy 24. Deuteronomy 24. Verse 14. Thou shalt not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren or of thy sojourners who are in thy land within thy gates. At his day thou shalt give him his hire, neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor, and setteth his heart upon it, lest he cry against thee unto the Lord, and it be sin unto thee. You say, gee, that's quite quaint stuff. I don't hire anybody. Yes, you do. Do you have bills to pay? Are there people that are expecting to be paid on time? Are the terms of your relationship 30 days from invoice or whatever they are, payable on demand, whatever they are? It's discouraging to hear repeatedly stories of practitioners, doctors, lawyers, others, who have, they'll be quick to point out to you that their uncollected receivables are mostly Christians. There's a tragic, tragic disease among us where Christians somehow feel disconnected from the consequences of their actions. We preach so hard about grace. We preach so hard that Christ died for our sins, and indeed he did. But somehow the words of honor and integrity don't get talked about enough, I don't believe, from the pulpits. We, uh, we aren't diligent in our obligations. And if we are delinquent in paying our debts, we're putting ourselves dangerously close to these people that James is talking about here. My turn to Leviticus 19. As long as I'm beating you up a little bit, let's just... Uh, Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19.13. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. Now, I'm not sure that applies in our particular culture. It did theirs that you paid when it was due and it was done at the end of the day. In our case, mostly it's on the, you know, by the 15th of the month or whatever the arrangements are. But we need to be diligent about that. Why? Because it's our witness. Not doing it because we're under the law, but because it's our witness. Proverbs 3, verses 27 to 8, Jeremiah 22, 13, we could obviously... Now, by the way, in the, in the verse 4, where it speaks of keeping back their wages, in the Greek, the tense implies that the laborers will never get their salaries. Not just delayed, but the... The, the Greek tense, the grammar implies the overtone is that they'll never get it. Now, private property and the respect of private property is ordained in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. That, all, that not only prohibits socialism, which is a form of theft, it also means that we, you and I, need to be diligent in paying our bills, because that's a form of stealing. Even a stall is denying the rightful use of that money to the one who has earned it and has contracted for it. Verse 5. James continues, Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in the a day of slaughter. Psalm 50 verse 10 says that all wealth belongs to the Lord. There's some of us that have been entrusted with more wealth than others, but in any case, it's a stewardship of the Lord. And uh, he permits us to be stewards of that, ultimately for his glory. And our diligence in handling it properly is part of our witness. So one of the questions you need to think about, as you know, if you're an investor, you can invest for the short term or the long term. And one of the questions you might think about is, are you investing for the real long term? Our days are a handbreadth, as you recall from last time and so forth. It's interesting, too, anyone that's done any real analysis knows that luxury quickly reaches a point of diminishing returns. There's a point at which there's certain... If you prosper, you win the lottery or something, there's a few things you'd like to add, but very quickly you'll discover that it's um, very quickly nonlinear. Twice as much is not twice as good. You know, I sometimes joke my motto in life used to be that if a little bit's good, a whole lot's a lot better. Well, <laughs> turns out that's not really true. The Quaker typically says, um, tell me what thou dost need, and I will tell thee how to get along without it. <laughs> And that's a wonderful attitude to have, especially in these days, because I think we are uh, graced with a, a year or two here of preparation in anticipation of what might be some very, very difficult times. Most of us have grown up in an optimistic culture. 
Most of us have grown up with the idea that our kids are going to have it better than we did. That's been the traditional American dream, the 50s, 60s, 70s, whatever. I think it's becoming very, very clear that that's deteriorating. It's very, very clear that the horizon in the next few years is going to be incredibly turbulent. And not just because of the millennium changeover, that's part of it. There's also some other issues on the horizon. In fact, a large number of them, any one of which can cause some major perturbations. It's a great time to streamline, lower one's cost of living, get out of debt, resolve an ability to be mobile financially as well as geographically. But in any case, uh, Jesus said in Luke 12, verse 15, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Life does not consist of possessions. And we should be guard. That's why being wealthy, strangely enough, um, raises the greed level, interestingly enough. You'd think it'd be inverse, but it's not. Luxury and self-indulgence. Luxury does t- is a symptom of self-indulgence, and that does lead, it has a way of corrupting character, of ruining character. Money itself is not sinful. Money is neutral, but it, uh, but having too much of it can cause one to drift into uh, self-indulgence and ruin one's character. It's interesting, of the Ten Commandments, all but one are operative. That is, you can tell if somebody's done it. You can tell if someone's killed or stolen or other things. There's one of the commandments that is the only one that's in the heart. The last one, coveting. And uh, it's interesting. It, it's the only commandment that really deals with motivation rather than the act. Uh, it's a sin of a, a... All of them, obviously, are sins of the heart, but they're manifest. The covet is is an internal thing, really. It's interesting. Abraham was a rich man, but he retained his character. When his nephew Lot became rich, uh, it ruined his character. He chose to be on the board of supervisors of Sodom. He sat at the gate. You have to understand the ancient culture to understand what that means. Uh, Psalm 62.10 says, If your riches increase, set not your heart upon them. That's the trick. You win the lottery or you get into a very favorable investment thing, be careful. God may bless you, but it also may be a test of where your heart remains focused. Proverbs 22, one, a good name rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Now, riches are always accompanied by uncertainties. The only certainty we have in life is what? Huh? Not death. Some of us may not die. It is judgment. All of us have an appointment. All of us have an appointment. We don't like to talk about it. We like to duck it, pretend it's not there. It's there. We all have an appointment before the throne. If you're in Christ, you won't be judged for your sins, but you will be judged for a lot of other things in terms of rewards and whatever. There's two, there's two different judgments. I won't start on all that. You all know that. But uh, the point is, that's certain. Death isn't as certain. Maybe I'm splitting hairs, but if the rapture occurs, there's some of us that uh, we won't die. I always love to stir up trouble by pointing out the people that died a thousand years ago, the people that died last month, and the people that get raptured a week from Tuesday all may arrive at the throne at the same instant. It's outside a different time dimension. So that may not be true, but at least it'll get you realizing that we're in a different dimensionality. Anyway, these guys are misusing their wealth. Now, this is a good time to get into Luke 16. It amazes me how many times I get into a theological discussion and it tracks back to this issue of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. Starting about verse 19, Jesus says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. So here's a rich guy. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus who was laid at his gate full of sores. Now, I want you to understand this is not a parable. Parables are little object lessons. Parables are little stories concocted to make a point. A parable is a rhetorical device, in effect, right? In parables, people don't have names. There really was a rich man. There really was this guy, Lazarus. This was, he is chronicling a real story here, not a, not a little uh, object lesson. This isn't a device. This is a, it's not a parable. It's an actual lesson. There was a guy named Lazarus. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. More of the dogs came and licked his horse. And by the way, I suspect that rich man probably took a tax ride off for those crumbs. But let's move on. <laughs> came to pass that the, the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abram's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. 
And in Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now this gets into some geometry we've got to talk about. In the Old Testament, there's a term called Sheol, meaning the grave or the abode. Of, it's not just the grave in its physical sense. It's the abode of the dead. And you can, if you do a word study, you'll quickly find that out. That's the, Sheol being the Hebrew of the Old Testament. The Greek term for the New Testament for essentially the same thing is Hades. Hades is not hell. It's sometimes translated hell. That's clumsiness. Hades is the Greek term for the abode of the dead. And from Luke 16, we get the impression that it has two compartments that are separated, the good guys and the bad guys. Over here we got Abram in Abram's bosom, and that's where the beggar ends up with Abraham. The rich man, for whatever reasons, is in the other place. Now we learn a lot about this. He's conscious. Not annihilated, he's conscious. He's in torment. He somehow knows or can see across this gulf between the two. Some people who make the little charts about this like to have that gulf between the two be the abuso. It may or may not be. There's also a place, separate from what we've talked about, called the abuso, the abyss, the bottomless pit, as it's sometimes translated. We know where the bottomless pit is. Did you know that? There's only one place it can be. And to, to, to dramatize this, you have to remember the little children's riddle. You know, uh, some campers set up camp, and they go 10 miles to the south, and they see bear tracks. And they follow this bear tracks 10 miles to the west, where they find the bear, shoot him, and they drag him 10 miles north back to the camp. The question is, what color is the bear? <laughs> has to be white, right? Because the only place you can go south, 10 miles west, and then north and back where you started is at the pole. Follow me? That's the idea. I'm giving you the short version. Okay. <laughs> where is the only place that you can have a bottomless pit? Where? Center of the earth, exactly. Because from the center of the earth, every direction is up. There's no, there's, there's no bottom. If you're at that point, every direction is up, isn't it? Right? It's very interesting that Hades and the Abuso are always spoken of in the scripture as being geocentric. Now that may be just a figure of speech, and many theologians would say it's just a, you know, is a figure of speech, and maybe it is. I don't think it is. I think it's real. The Gehenna, the lake with fire, is in the outer darkness. They're opposites geometrically. And of course, to fill in the blanks here so you don't get confused, we believe that when Jesus on the cross, when he was resurrected, he was the first fruits of a resurrection. In Matthew 27, we have a strange allusion to many other graves opened and then walked and so forth. And that was, the, he was the first of a sheaf. It had to be a sheaf to fulfill the prophecy of, of the first fruits. But the point is, at that point, most of us infer that the good side of Hades is cleaned out. They're with him now. The others are waiting their final judgment. Okay? We're together? That save you. That's where this is. Most of this come, comes from here and some other passages. Verse 24. The uh, rich man sees uh, Lazarus in Abraham's wisdom. In verse 24 he says, He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I, have, I am tormented in this flame. Now I think this probably is anthropomorphic because he's no longer physical. He's in a different dimensionality, but still that's the analogy. He's in pain. And verse 25, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they who would pass from, uh, from here to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from there. In other words, you can't cross this gulf. It doesn't work. Maybe a total different dimensionality. I don't know exactly what's going on. But anyway, verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abram said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. You can almost hear a Jewish accent there, can't you? Right? <laughs> and he said, Nay, Father Abraham. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one even rose from the dead. Now you get the irony here. Because there was a different Lazarus, but Lazarus was raised from the dead. And what did they do about it? They plotted to kill him. That was a big problem, have Lazarus walking around after, after that whole thing, you know, for Bethany and so on. And uh, they had to kid, knock him off too. It's very interesting. Uh, I really wonder if the rich man knew the name of Lazarus before this event. 
I wonder when he was at the door begging if the rich man even countenanced him. I wonder if Jesus mentions his name here to Abraham. It's ironic. He mentions Lazarus' name. He doesn't ever mention the rich man's name. Verse 6, continuing. James says, Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not, re- and he does not resist you. You know the old expression, the golden rule, he that has the gold rules. And one of the frightening things that we see in cultures for thousands of years, and we see it happening in America. America was founded to avoid these traditional injustices. The concept of due process, the concept of having the protection of the law. It's interesting that wealth and power control the due process, as it's called. As we look at the the trials, I won't mention the specific ones. You can fill in the blank. I don't want to get a lot of letters. There's a joke that they finally found Adolf Hitler. I got some good news and bad news. The good news is they finally caught Adolf Hitler. The bad news is they're going to try him in Los Angeles. (laughs) The obstruction of justice in the highest office of the land. Deuteronomy 17 deals with that. Exodus 18.21 asks the judges not to be greedy. Leviticus 19.15 for the judges not to be partial to the rich. Deuteronomy 19, 16 through 21, not to tolerate perjury. And bribery was condemned by Isaiah 33, 15, Micah in chapter 3 and chapter 7. It goes on and on. And Amos condemned the judges that took bribes and fixed cases in Amos chapter 5. On it goes. It's interesting that le- probably about a decade or less from the time that James wrote this epistle, the Roman legions under Titus Vespasian, the son of the emperor, and uh, four, uh, the, the 5th, 10th, 12th, and 15th Roman legions laid siege to Jerusalem. And after a nine months of a bloody war, 1,350,000 people, men, women, and children murdered, that these rich ones that he was talking about lost their riches and probably their lives. It's interesting that you and I live in a parallel We live in a very prosperous land where we take prosperity for granted. And yet it's not very, very hard to take a hard, objective look at our distant horizon and realize that there may be a very painful parallel. There may be turbulence and and problems forthcoming. And if our heart is set upon things and prosperity and wealth, which are ephemeral, of course, rather than the Lord, that can be discouraging. And yet, if you understand the scenario that's unfolding, boy, it's the most exciting time to be alive in human history. It depends where your heart is. Whether your heart is on things or on the Lord climaxing his promises. Now, there's another aspect to all of this that I don't think you'll find in a Bible study, but I have to throw it in here. As most of you know, I spent three decades in deals, investments, um, doing mergers and acquisitions, what have you. There is a cost that most people never derive from their accountants, but the smart guys are very sensitive to it. And I can remember being in a situation, I was blessed with the opportunity to participate in a situation with Bill Simon, former Secretary of Treasury. He was uh, in private uh, life, and, and he asked me to join this board of a company we were trying to turn around. One of the things that always, his major yardstick when we're dealing with things, was what he called the opportunity cost. It isn't the cost-benefit of this particular possibility. Is okay, what are the alternatives and what could they yield? In other words, if you go plan A, you might make a million dollars, but the effort and energy and time it might take, in contrast to plan B, where you might make $10 million. The $9 million difference is the cost of going on plan A. See, in other words, the cost of missing the other opportunity. To someone who is a venture capitalist, one of the things, you can rarely quantify it in dollars, but one of the things you're very conscious of, it isn't just whether a particular proposition is profitable. Is it as profitable as spending our energy on an alternative situation? You can work, spend a year of real hard work developing a $1 million project, and it probably takes you no more work over here to build a $20 million project. If 
follow me? There's a, there's a cost to matter. Wherever you, you, you only have today. Tomorrow, today's history. There's an opportunity cost today. You understand what I'm saying? And that's another aspect here. The opportunity of an alternative allocation of time, effort, resources, whatever, should be considered. Ephesians 5.16 speaks of redeeming the time, right? We always use that expression, redeeming the time. And it carries that idea. And uh, we must work while it is day, for the night is coming. Jesus tells us in John chapter 9, verse 4. Part of what should move us is a sense of urgency, not panic or anxiety, but a sense of urgency to make every day count. If we have resources to allocate, it's always important to create alternatives. You go to the local hardware store, and there's a particular tool that really would make neat for the family workshop. The question isn't whether that tool is a good idea or not. It's a question of making a list of alternatives. Is that the place you really want to spend your money on, that one versus this one or something totally different? Part of any analysis is analysis of the alternatives. And as you uh, allocate your time or your dollars, is the Lord in it? Are the priorities that are being applied to your resources as a steward the priorities that God would approve? Have you entered in those situations prayerfully? Those are all issues. I'm reminded, uh, uh, how many of you saw the movie Schindler's List? Do you remember the touching scene near the end of the movie where it hits him, for lack of a better term, Schindler's regret? He realized the ring on his finger or the bat, you know, that, that could have saved another life. What came home to him was the long-term implications of his near-term actions. I'm sure he shed tears as he thought about the wasteful years. And maybe not the naive early years where he just didn't realize what's going on, but as time went on and he appreciated this, the predicament that he was facing. And as he began to plan to try to save some of his employees. And as that unfolds, uh, with a gradually increasing desperation, boy, can you imagine, put yourself in his shoes near the end. When, okay, what's done is done, it's time to move on. And he realizes that by being just a little more committed, he could have saved just a... We sort of sit back and say, wow, look what you did accomplish. But then again, his point of view is what he might have had he been a little more focused, a little more stewardsman-like. Anyway, it's good to have things that money can buy, but only if you already have the things money can't buy. And that comes first. What good is a million-dollar house if you have no home? What good is a million-dollar diamond ring if you have no love? Or as one person asked the question, are we buying things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't even like? What we keep, we lose. What we give to God, we not only keep, but get interest on it. That's a good deal. A famous preacher who was known for his long sermons was uh, giving a charity, uh, you know, annual charity appeal. He was asked not to speak too long for fear of losing the audience. So he, he read this text from Proverbs 19.17. He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth to the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. And the sermon was, if you like the terms, then put down your money. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) That was it. (laughs) This whole epistle of what I like to call the epistle of Yaakov to the twelve tribes, of course, is a epistle about spiritual maturity. He's speaking to Christians, and they were largely Jewish at the time he wrote this. And the epistle is a a spiritual maturity is essentially about patience. He took after the the money guys here in terms of their their failure to really appreciate the true long-term perspective. But now he's going to get into patience more specifically in verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman, husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. He's using the farmer as an analogy. The farmer understands patience. He knows he's got to prepare the ground. He plants the seed. Nothing he can do can rush the seed. He knows he's just got to take care of it and ultimately... And by the way, when he says the the early and latter rain, remember the year started in the fall. So the early rain is in the fall. The latter rain is in the spring. We we think, see, our our calendar is different than the one they're used to. But he's using the agrarian model here, and and the farmer has patience because he knows ultimately in the spring the little 
the, the buds will come up, they'll grow, and there'll be crops, and there'll be fruit. And he knows that he can't rush the fruit. He knows the fruit will be provided if he's just patient and diligent. He doesn't make the fruit, God does. But his job is to be diligent and prepare and do his job, and God will provide the increase and uh, provide for him. And so he's using that here. And I think the secret to um, what I call strategic patience is to keep focused on the second coming of Christ, to get right at it. The analogy is the farmer waiting for the, you know, uh, the fruit in, the, in his case, he has the advantage. In his case, it's scheduled. He knows so many months if he's patient come. And we don't know when the Lord's coming. Could ne- come tomorrow, next week, whatever. That's an advantage. But everything we do, everything we do, should have as a yardstick our blessed hope. What Titus calls us our uh, blessed hope. Now, there are two words for patience in the scripture. One really means long suffering. And the other one really is endurance. And some scholars, Greek scholars, believe the long-suffering re- refers to patience with respect to people. And endurance it refers to patience with respect to circumstances. But you have to understand, Greek is probably has the largest vocabulary of any language ever on the planet Earth. It's got a huge vocabulary. It's very precise, and some of these subtleties uh, may be appropriate. It, interesting, David also was troubled by the prosperity of the wicked. We might turn to Psalm 37. Oh, let's just pick up about verse 35. David says, I have seen the wicked in great power, spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but could not be found. It's interesting, the answer to this really is um, verse 7. David says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. It's amazing. The same Habakkuk in the Old Testament has the same burden. Why do the wicked prosper? And uh, I encourage you to, to, uh, to deal with it. If you have an eschatology that's a pre-trib point of view, which is the one I happen to share, and that's not a problem. Right? If there's some people here that are post-trib, it's not a problem. We'll explain it to you on the way up. It's not an issue. <laughs> um, but there is a difference in the walk. Barnhouse used to kid Walter Martin when he came to work. He uh, say, the sad day, sad day, Jesus can't come back today because he knew that Walter leaned to a post-trip view, and, and uh, that implies there's seven years of history that has to precede the second coming, which is, we think, contrary to Scripture. Clearly, Christ taught us, the New Testament teaches the doctrine of eminence. He could come at any moment. And uh, that's why we believe there's a very big distinction between the rapture and the second coming. He comes back twice, once for the church, once for Israel. But the point is, the clear teaching of the New Testament, that he can come at any moment, is one of the most galvanizing aspects of the Scripture. You and I have the privilege uh, to live our lives in a moment-by-moment expectancy. Boy, does that make decisions easier. That makes decisions easier. Big danger to allow yourself to think, gee, it, it, I think it's going to be a few years off. For in such a day, hours ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Anyway, the Christian, of course, is analogous here to a farmer, sensitive to the seasons, to sowing, watering, and so forth. Verse 8, Be ye also patient... Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. James also points to the eminence of Jesus' return as a motivator for their actions. And, of course, the secret to patience of the farmer is that the harvest he's anticipating is worth waiting for. And the secret you and I have is that our harvest is also worth waiting for. Verse 9, Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. When you're impatient with people, that betrays an impatience with God. And you don't want to be impatient with God. <laughs> We're supposed to put our sickles in for the harvest. I don't know why Christians use their sickles on each other all the time. But let's move on, verse 10. Now he's going to, uh, James is going to shift to the prophets. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for the example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Jesus also used the example of the prophets as an example of victory over persecution in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, 11, and 12. He deals, he points to the persecution of the prophets. You and I, in 2 Timothy 3, among other places, are promised persecution. The Lord was obedient, and what did it lead to him? To the cross. It led him to the cross. You, you can go through example after example. Elijah announced to wicked King Ahab that there would be a drought for three and a half years. And he, he had to suffer that drought too. Now he got fed by ravens and things, but the point is, we'll talk a little bit more about it. James is going to bring this up a little later. But it's interesting that the prophets also suffered not just at the hands of the unbelievers, but also the believers. They suffered at the hands of believers too. So why are we surprised? 
Jeremiah was arrested as a traitor and thrown in, uh, into an abandoned well to die. And that was by his own people. Ezekiel and Daniel also had their share of hardships, but God, of course, delivered them. The New Testament presents the persecution of the prophets as proverbial. And I have a list of 11 examples of this that I'll spare you, but we'll just take one because it's a sample in Hebrews 11. Turn to the epistle to the Hebrews, uh, chapter 11. Grab a couple of a quick glimpse there. After going through uh, Adam and Noah and Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Rahab, he gets to verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David, and of Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, famine, uh, became valiant in, uh, in flight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Uh, women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tested, were slain without the sword, I mean, with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having received witness through faith, received not the promise, God having provided something better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. In other words, that's a whole other point there. I'll go on. Verse 11 of James. James continues, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Why do people who proclaim the Lord endure difficult trials? Well, one suggestion is so that their lives can back up their messages. That's what God's interest in. Enduring counts. And I think many obscure heroes will receive the rewards and his rewards he brings with them. And one way we get a feeling for this is to spend more time in the Bible because it's interesting how the Bible in the New Testament and Old uses these, this history, these narratives as examples for our learning. And it's interesting too, <laughs> the Lord ministered to me, you know, Job had three friends. <laughs> with friends like that, you don't need enemies, you know. As I read Job, I, I keep wondering if these guys, these three friends, uh, published newsletters or had websites. You know, I, I really wonder. And, of course, the friends were wrong, and God took up the cause. Uh, he had no cause against Job, and God rebuked his friends, ultimately, for telling that about uh, Job. What Job, what we have that Job didn't have is the perspective. We are treated in chapter 1 to the dialogue between Satan and God. So as we watch the narrative, we know what's going on. Job didn't have the benefit of that discussion. He just trusted God. Mm. Boy. And, of course, God never wastes the suffering of his saints. Job himself met God even in a deeper way, as he describes in chapter 42. The impatient Christian is a weapon in Satan's hands. And Moses' impatience robbed him of his opportunity to enter the promised land. And Abraham's impatience led to the birth of Ishmael. And look what's derived from that. Peter's impatience in the garden almost made him a murderer. When Jesus healed the ear of the high priest's servant, he was saving Peter's life. Paul, when he's thrown in the flesh, my grace is sufficient for thee, and so forth. So you and I are not a robot caught in the jaws of fate. We're a child of God, and uh, we're part of his profound and wonderful plan. It's up to us to be... To, to trust him. That's really all he wants to do is to trust us. Now, from here, uh, James starts talking about straight talk. As I think you all recognize by reading any daily paper, that honesty is becoming a very rare commodity in our country. Perjury under solemn oath is epidemic. In our courts, in the solemn vows of marriage, and in the assertions of the highest office of the land. Romans 3.13 says their tongues practice deceit. And uh, we know from Leviticus 19.12 and Numbers 32 and Deuteronomy 23.21 that breaking vows is forbidden. The scripture never asks you to take a vow, but if you take it, it expects you to keep it. And that's very, very clear in the Torah and elsewhere. 
Verse 12, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. The same thing that Jesus said in the, on the Sermon on the Mount, when Peter was pouring out his oaths that night, after Gethsemane, uh, Matthew 26, um, he was giving evidence that his character was still in need of transformation. I'm always reminded by this yay, yay, nay, nay passage. I was uh, an executive getting briefed by Bell Labs research people on their advanced projects. In those days, the telephone company was very much an analog outfit, and the head of the digital group, which is sort of a maverick group within the organization, says in a complex organization, very important to have a very clear mandate. And the digital communication people, this is way back, this is many years ago, he said... Uh, our mandate, we take our mandate from uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 34, where the Lord himself says, let your communication be yea, yea, or nay, nay, whatsoever, more than these is of evil. That was his point. It's digital, not analog. And, of course, he's being facetious. But uh, as an engineer, you may not follow that. But anyway, I've always, I, always, I always think of that uh, as a, an amusing play on words. But anyway, there are, however, by the way, some people say, gee, we shouldn't take oaths at all. In a civil proceeding, you certainly can. You can use the Lord as his example because before Caiaphas in Matthew 26, he takes an oath. I adjure thee by the living God, tell us, you know, and so forth. And he does. Paul calls God as a witness in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 23, and also Romans 1, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. So they're permitted, although not encouraged. But in, in a court of law, to take an oath is, is scripturally sound, although you can affirm thanks to some change in regulations. From here, well, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. Um, James turns to prayer. A little while ago, a few few lessons ago, we noticed that James spent a lot of time on the misuse of the tongue. He talked a lot about the unruly, unruly member called the tongue. On the negative side, gossip and all that sort of thing. What's the on the positive side? What is the highest use of your tongue? Prayer. Well, glorifying God in general, but prayer specifically. You betcha. Proclaiming His word and in prayer. And uh, seven times in the coming section, he's going to mention prayer. And the first thing he talks about is prayer for the suffering. Verse 13, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Now, afflicted, actually, in the Greek means suffering in difficult circumstances. We know we're not supposed to grumble. He mentioned that in verse 9 of this chapter. And prayer can give us the grace to endure troubles and to use them to glorify God. If you're in trouble, what's the first thing you should do is pray. To remove the trouble, no, that you might perform under the conditions of trouble that will glorify God. That's, that may be why the trouble is there. Give you an opportunity for witness. God alone can transform troubles into triumphs. He can turn weakness into strengths. There's a lot of verses. I'll spare you that right now. But remember, Jesus prayed in Gethsemane three times for the cup to be removed, and it was not. So it may be in God's plan to have you go through with whatever is facing you. What you should be praying for is to be equipped uh, to do that to God's glory. And a mature Christian knows that God is able to give songs in the night, as it says in Job 35.10. God did this for Paul and Silas when they were in the Philippian jail, if you call in Acts chapter 16. Might just comment a little bit about the believer's praise. The believer's praise should be intelligent and not just mouthing words. I uh, often, whenever I share a platform with Dave Hunt, uh, he often mumbles to me. He's very discouraged about some, some of the modern music. He calls it 7-Eleven music. Seven words repeated 11 times. <laughs> and, uh, and he loves to articulate the lyrics of some of the grand old hymns that really express the gospel, deep spiritual truths. And modern music didn't bother me much since, uh, until Dave made that remark. Now every time I listen, hey, he's right. You know? uh, so in any case, it should come from the heart, Ephesians 5.19, motivated by the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 5.18, and based, of course, on the Word of God. Verse 14, praying for the sick. Are there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. This is the only prescription for this in the Scripture. You know that? And by the way, just to give you some alternative views here, there are two Greek words that are translated anoint. One is krio, which is it's where it's anointed in the religious sense. It's from this that we get the anointed one. Christ comes from that same root, the word for Christos, or the anointed one. It only appears five times in the New Testament, which is the anointing of Christ by the Father with the Holy Spirit. The other word is uh, eleipho, which is a Greek medicinal term. Uh, in Matthew 6, 17, it's to prepare oneself. It could be translated massaging, to rub with oil, but in, in the medicinal sense. 
And so some scholars make a big point of this. They say what James is really talking about here isn't necessarily anointing in the, in the ecclesiastical sense. It's anointing in the medicinal sense. But, uh, uh, but here we're dealing with the sovereignty of God, and, and scholars divide it. I, don't want to, I just want to mention that in passing. But the real issue about healing is a really cruel hoax by those that would teach that uh, God heals in every case. That's God's, God's not, his desire is that you not be ill. And uh, that's a very, that is uh, denying both scripture and experience. Paul had to leave Trophimus uh, sick uh, in Miletus in uh, 2 Timothy 4.20. Epaphroditus, his beloved friend, was ill and almost died in Philippians 2.27. Paul prayed three times for his own removal of the thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians 12 and had to endure it until the end. It is an unscriptural and also kind of experience to have, it's a cruel hoax on the family and friends of someone who's sick to argue that God didn't intend them to be, you know, that the so-called uh, word of faith thing is tragic. But let's move on. And uh, notice also that praying here should be plural, plural, elders. Whenever someone does come up to me for prayer for illness or some medical kind of thing, I always get a plurality of elders. Why? So if it the Lord's will to heal that person, it's clearly the Lord and not some unique gift. You follow what I'm saying? And so uh, we always have a body of elders to do that. And sometimes God will do incredible miracles. I can tell you some of those right within our own staff. But there's also cases where he, it's God's will to, he has another purpose in the whole situation. Far be it from us to prejudge that. What we, our prayer should be is that uh, if it be his will to provide the healing and what have you, Comfort the family, but by all means, let whatever is happening magnify his name. Show himself strong. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord will raise them up, and if he hath committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. There is the undertone here for several reasons that the person that he's dealing with here uh, is also guilty of sin. That doesn't mean we can't generally apply it, but you should understand if you study this exegetically very carefully, there's that undertone. Anyway, the prayer of faith he speaks of here in verse 15 is offered when we know the will of God. A prayer of faith implies you are, you can do that when we know the will of God. This is certainly a case when, when the sickness is a result of continuing in sin. And that's what the Greek implies here in the grammar. But in any case, always remember the Christians bar of soap. 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we can always claim that. And we never sin alone, it always affects others. In fact, any sin affects the whole church. But then the prayer of the righteous. It's interesting, in the 4th century, one of the greatest preachers in the church, John of Antioch, became uh, very well known because of his very careful exegesis, his unrelenting application, and his unmatched eloquence. He was given a nickname, uh, Christitum, which means uh, golden mouth. But here's his description of prayer. I, I was so impressed with it, I decided to just extract it. The potency of prayer has subdued the strength of fire. It has bridled the rage of lions. It has hushed anarchy to rest. It has extinguished wars, appeased the elements, expelled demons, burst the chains of death, expanded the fates of heaven, assuaged diseases, dispelled frauds, rescued cities from destruction, stayed the sun in its course, arrested the progress of the thunderbolt. There is in it uh, an all-sufficient panoply for a treasure undiminished, a mind that is never exhausted, a sky unobscured by clouds, a heaven unruffled by the storm. It is the root, the fountain, the mother of a thousand blessings. Fourth century writing. I'm impressed. Anyway, moving on. Verse 16. James continues, Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And this also tends to echo back and confirm that the case that was earlier discussed is one of someone that was under church discipline, analogous to 1 Corinthians 5. By the way, Eusebius, um, in his writings, called James old camel knees. James was a man of prayer, so much so that uh, they called him camel knees, because presumably he had calluses on his knees. <laughs> what, a neat, what a nickname, huh? I love the bumper sticker. If you are accused of being a Christian, is there enough evidence to convict you? Anyway, verse 17, Elias, and by the way, that's simply the Greek for Elijah. Elijah was a man subject to like passions we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by a space of three years and six months. And by the way, I'm fascinated. You may recall in 1 Kings 17 and 18, in the interest of time, I won't take you through it, the, the shortness of the hour has spared you. I rarely miss an opportunity to recount the whole event on Mount Carmel and Elijah's big showdown with the priests of Baal. Dramatic stuff. I don't know how DeMille missed that one. It was a great one. Uh, what's interesting, of course, is that Elijah 
prophesied that it would not rain. He called a drought for three and a half years. At the end of that, he prays and the rain comes. Now, what's interesting about that, you will not learn about that, that precisely from the Old Testament. James here talks about it. And from James, you discover that it was Elijah that caused the drought. Two people in the New Testament, Jesus and James, make reference to the three and a half years. And I think it's very interesting because it somehow got dropped out of the Old Testament. It talks about it, but you don't get the impression that Elijah started and stopped it and the three and a half years is clear. You get that from New Testament comments. This is one of the places where we learn something about the Old Testament from its recounting in the New. In Luke 4.25, when, the, when they're going to throw Jesus off the, uh, the brow of a hill, there's a whole thing about that that we don't have time for. Okay, we'll move on. Um, <laughs> Uh, see, in verse 18, he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. This is um, a very fascinating thing, because in Revelation chapter 11, in verse 6, it speaks of the two witnesses. And everybody wonders who the two witnesses are. They're clearly people, because they die, and their bodies lay in the street, and they, you know, after three days, they, they on CNN, the whole world watches them. they got a big scoop. But everybody wonders who they are. Well, if you study that passage carefully, there are four specific powers that these two witnesses have. Two of those powers are unique to Moses, and two of those powers are unique to Elijah. So I'm among those. doesn't mean I'm right, but just so you know, I'm one of these guys that believes, literally, Moses and Elijah are the two witnesses. Partly because one of those powers is to shut up the rain for three and a half years. And only one guy did that in the Old Testament. That's Elijah. And the other one is to call down fire from heaven. That's what Elijah did in, in, with the... Uh, the situation about Mount Carmel. The other uh, was it had to do with plagues and uh, turning water into blood, which, of course, Moses did in uh, Exodus 9, uh, 9, 10, and 11, right in that area. So the point is, that's, what, and I also suspect that the Mount of Transfiguration was a staff meeting planning all this. Anyway, it's a view. No, I'm sure, yeah, okay. We're going to talk about the straying, the person that's stray. The Old Testament term is a backsliding, but, uh, or New Testament overtaken with a fault, Galatians 6, 1, whatever. Verse 19, if, uh, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him. Now, the word err in the Greek is wander. The Greek is at, at Palano, Palano, which is the word from which we get planet or heavenly wander. If Peter back there at the Gethsemane had been praying instead of sleeping, he probably wouldn't have denied the Lord that night. Poor Peter. He's going to be known throughout eternity as the guy that denied the Lord. See, brethren, if, if you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. By the way, do believers need to be converted? Jesus said to Peter, this is in Luke 22, verse 32, when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. See, when you're back in fellowship, when you get it together, then, and you will, because I prayed for you, but, you know, how important it is that we seek to save, to, to win the saved. We don't think about that very much. Matthew 18, 15, More if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go tell him his fault between thee and him alone, and he shall hear thee. Thou hast gained thy brother. The word gain means one, one your brother. Matthew 18, that's where you've got a fault with your brother. There's a procedure for that. It isn't to go run around and start a lot of gossip. It's to one-on-one hit it head-on. And love shall cover a multitude of sins. James mentioned this, and Peter does also in 1 Peter 4, 8. And they're simply applying the principle in Proverbs 10, 12, that love covers a multitude of sins. And here the application is to a straying brother in Christ. How much more do we need to do that to someone who's lost altogether? That's even more important. Seeking the lost, of course, is a frequent picture. We see it in Luke 15, where Jesus pictures lost sheep, a lost coin, lost son, and so on. In Zechariah 3, 2 and Jude 23, we have a different model used where the soul winner is pictured as a fireman pulling the brand out of the fire. It takes risks of love to do that. One little final exam and we're through tonight. I'll just give you a few questions. This is a summary of the book of James. That's where the chapter's last one. Some questions for you to think about on your way home tonight. Am I becoming more and more patient in the testings of life? It's a question. You don't have to raise your hand. (laughs) Do I play with temptation or resist it from the start? Do I find joy in obeying the Word of God or do I merely study and learn it? Do I find joy in the obeying of the Word of God or do I just study and fill notebooks or whatever? Are there any prejudices that shackle me? Am I able to control my tongue? Am I a peacemaker or a troublemaker? Do people come to me for my spiritual wisdom? Am I a friend of God or a friend of the world? Can't be both. Do I make plans without considering the will of God? 
Am I selfish when it comes to money? Am I unfaithful in paying my bills? Do I naturally depend on prayer when I find myself in some kind of trouble? Or is prayer a last resort? It should be our first resort. Am I the kind of person that others seek for prayer support? And what's my attitude towards the wandering brother? Do I criticize and gossip, or do I seek to restore him in love? A little test. That concludes our formal study, verse-by-verse study of the book of James. Next time, we're going to explore some strange heresies that are surfacing in our culture from the Shroud of Turin and how it relates to the Knights of Templar, the Knights of Templar, I mean, and what does that have to do with James? Very, very strange stuff. Uh, we'll do that, address that next time as we conclude our study of Jacob's letter to the 12 tribes. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Well, Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you, Father, that there are no accidents in your kingdom, that we're all here together right now by your divine appointment. We would ask, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, that you would help us to be ever more diligent in appropriating your word to our lives that we indeed might be doers of your word and not hearers only. We do pray, Father, for improved bridling of our unruly tongues, but rather that they might be instruments for magnifying your name and declaring your truth. And Father, we do ask for enlightened stewardship of those resources that you've entrusted to us, that they indeed might be used for your glory, that we indeed might redeem the time that remains. We thank you, Father, for bringing us together, but we thank you above all, Father, for the redemption that you've gone to such extremes to provide for us as we commit ourselves in accordance with your commandment before your throne. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.